There's a verse in the Quran that I often find myself pondering over, and it says, And I have not created jinn and men except to worship me. Um, it's from Surah 51, Variat, and it's verse 56. I often allow myself to really go deeper into this verse because there's so much to it, even though it sounds like a pretty simplistic message. Often people ask themselves, why me? Why am I here? Why was I ever created? And I suppose at any given moment, say right now, everyone just stop and think about what is the worst thing that you're going through and what is the best thing that you're going through and what is the thing that you hope to be going through. And I'm sure it often causes confusion as to why am I struggling with the things that I'm struggling with and why can't I just have more of the things that I really appreciate? Yes, so this very existential question, why am I here and what is the purpose of my life? is something that is really heating up, you know. And we have in the Quran a magistral verse that is a great and absolute answer to this question. Um, but you need really to stop at this verse because as it is deep, it is not easy. Exactly. It seems easy. I've only created you but to worship me. It so, sounds like it's such an easy message. But really, the more I think about it is, okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean that when I'm going through the worst time of my life and when someone's just going through real difficulties, are they supposed to stop and think and say, okay, this is my time to continue to worship him, even though I'm just so scattered and I can't think straight? Yes, and when we think like that, we are jumping into conclusions, into, let's say, predefined concepts we have in our head about what all of this means. That when Allah says, I have only created jinn and men so that they worship me, we, we are immediately thinking that all these concepts of, exist, of creation, of what is a jinn, what is a man, and the question of worship... Oh, and we, we all have these concepts, but are they clear in our mind? I don't think so. And the question is also, why just jinn and men were created? Weren't other beings created? Weren't there plants that were created? Weren't angels created? So the fact that this verse is speaking about jinn, which are fire beings, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how I translate it in English, um, and and men... Absolutely. But they are fire, like not the fire, the energy fire that we mm -hmm. have when we light up a chimney. They're like spirits. It's a different type of creation in mm -hmm. a parallel universe, if you want to talk like that. Okay. Okay. But uh, Allah tells us that they were created from fire and wind or air. And this is an alchemical view of things. It's not a molecular view or it's a materialistic view. It's a different way of looking at the creation that is embedded in Quran. But uh, men, for example, are said to be created from uh, earth or turab uh, and uh, water. But, yeah. it, but it's not water like the flowing water right. that we have in our tap. Right. right? It's a concept. Exactly. Uh, and there are four concepts. So water, earth, fire, and wind, or air. And the fifth, which is nur, which is light, if you want, but it's not the light, the, the photon. Okay, It's a spiritual light. And so we know that jinn are made of these two, air and fire. Mm -hmm. Men are made of uh, earth and water. and water, and the angels are made of nur. So the system is complete, right? Mm. And now Allah is telling us, is giving us a great answer, but we need to stop and to really explore, because it is a magistral verse. By the answers it can give you, in one of the most important questions that can, you know, be facing a mm -hmm. thinking being. Right. Regarding the reason for his, his, his existence. Right. And also his final destination. Right. Right. Why am I here? Yes. And where am I going? Yes. What's the point of all of this? Yeah. And since this verse is dealing with questions of existence and destiny, it it's really addresses, um, let's say, occupation or mind thinking of many people you know? mm -hmm. uh, and especially those 
uh, who are facing religion and all these, you know, this is forbidden, this is allowed, mm -hmm. all these rules. And for them, it is a serious problem. What is a serious problem? All these rules when they when okay. they deal with to live by the religions. rules. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they are they are really questioning, you know. Okay, I'm a Muslim, but really Salah five times a day, you know, mm -hmm. and Siyam, all of this. Why? What's yeah. the point? Especially right? if they don't know why. Yes. When you know why, then you actually run to the praying five times yes, a day and all these other rules. Many people have this question. This this verse is meant to answer this question. And there are people who are even more questioning. There are those who are submitted to a lot of trials and who are suffering a lot on this earth, you know. And when you are facing trials and suffering, you really end up questioning the real reason for your existence. Yes. And if these people who are facing these problems have a certain level of consciousness and faith, then this very questioning is a suffering itself, right? Yeah. Because in reality, when you end up questioning the reason for your existence that way, it is almost hiding a, a complaint. Mm -hmm. It's almost hiding an objection. It's like a, a, a revolt. Mm -hmm. It's like this person would say to God, they don't, they really don't question the existence of God. Right. But they end up with this relation, t telling God, uh, consciously or unconsciously, why did you create me, yeah. my Lord? Why did you put me in this world of suffering? Yeah. And why me? And why am I going why through Why do I have to go through these trials and this suffering in this way, you know? Because all I want is good. Mm. And I'm facing all of this. So this verse, when you read it carefully, it answers not only to these questions, but it, it goes beyond in its answers, in elevation and in grandeur. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, the answers that this verse provide, um, they are themselves, they can be a problem. They can be a problem for many people. Why? Because they are not elevating themselves enough to understand these answers. Okay. So in, order, in order to understand the verse correctly, you need to work on yourself, elevate yourself to a level of understanding where these answers make sense. Okay, so you have to work at it yes. in order for you to get any answers as to why me, why yes. am I here, and what's my purpose? And especially when we're facing a verse from the Quran. Mm -hmm. The Quran is the word of Allah. It's not a human speech. It's not a human information. Mm -hmm. So, so it's the purest place you can go to find the absolute truth because yes. you know it's not been tampered with, yes. which is profound. It's huge. Yes, but... At the same time, Allah is asking us to think and to elevate ourselves in our understanding. It's, we, we may, and there is a principle in Islam, that when you read the Quran, there is a first truth, that everything that, is, that you cannot understand, okay, or that seems to you to be a problem in a Quranic verse, it is only a mirror that reveals your true culture, so your if, true mentality, and your true concepts that you carry. Because in reality, the verse that you are facing reveals the problems that you have in yourself. So if I have a problem with any verse, that's... The problem is in you. The problem in me. And that's a great reflection or a great way for me to reflect, let's yes. say, on myself and what I need to work on. Exactly. That's profound. That's huge. And with the nur of Allah, with his light, with his guidance, the point is not to say this verse is a problem for me and need to accept it. No, I need to face the fact that it causes a problem in me and I need to be sure that the problem is in me and not in the verse. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to work on what is making me so uncomfortable that it's causing me a problem. And once I have understood, I have elevated myself and now the verse is very clear and the answers flow, right? So is this prescriptive in the sense that... It's a principle. It's, it, it's a principle, I understand. But for example, uh, how much of a struggle is it? It must well, it must take a lot out of us to first of all accept that we have that problem that we have um, something to work on absolutely. and then um, to understand what direction we go to find that work 
so that we can do the work. You know, we can go in many directions. There's self-help gurus out there. There's um, books and there's training courses. You know, so where do I go to get that right kind of work? Because if I do the wrong kind of work, I'm going to be back to square one. You go to the Quran and you read it objectively. And the answers are there. Wow. Wow. So... And um, so let, let's try with this verse, right? Mm -hmm. So let's try to uncover what kind of uneasiness or problem we may find in this verse when we read it the first time or no. So take the example of someone that li is living today and has the culture of today and is basing his thinking on the concepts of today. If we ask this person to express very sincerely the impression that is triggered in him or in her after reading this verse. And we can even easy the task by asking a question. Deep inside you, when you read this verse, do you feel uh, peace? Do you, feel, do you have a, a feeling of acceptation with peace? Or on the contrary, do you feel a certain in uneasiness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The answer of the contemporary reader we, will be in general, after hesitating, you know, because usually people don't like to talk about these things. Right. It's the verse of the Quran. You're not supposed to put you une uneasy. Sure. But inside, there is this uneasiness. So after some, let's say, uh, uh, malaise, the person will say, no, really, I hesitate, but... In, in fact, I can say, if I'm truthful, that I, I feel an uneasiness. Mm. And if you ask the person to do, for the reasons mm. of this uneasiness, the person will ask you um, a question that reveals really the, what is at the core of the convictions of the person. What kind of a question? What do you mean? They will ask themselves a question. Yeah, he will ask you, but why did God need to create us? And the verse says, so that you can worship me. Yes, so God you, says, so that you can worship me. But why did he need to do that? Okay. Right? Yeah. So then we can demonstrate to the person that this very question, from its very onset, has absolutely no foundation. Because it's only a human projection on the Creator. Because, what is only a human projection on the because Creator? Because when you ask this question, why did he need to create us? Yeah. Then... You know, the human beings, they act and they move because they face certain needs. Okay. But him, subhanahu, is El Rani, is the one who doesn't do anything because he needs it. Right. Okay, he doesn't do anything because he needs it. So he doesn't need us to worship him. So no. therefore, we can deduce that worshiping him is for us. It's for our benefit. Absolutely. So... When people look at that verse, some might feel anxiety, like, what? I was only created to, to worship him? So oh, let's unpack. Well, yeah, yes. exactly. I mean, that, that, can, that can be very telling about a person, so, but also about this question. Yeah, yeah. So after the person has gone through this phase of asking, why did he need to create us? Uh, and facing the fact that he forgot that God is not moving by any need. Not, then once you have gone through this first step, we can ask again this our question to the person, and we can ask the person to, to go and research in his very intimate conviction the reason for its uneasiness in front of the verse. Mm -hmm. And the answer will be, and especially if the person is influenced by what is called the free thinking, right? The person will say, well, you know, I think that I can detect in this verse a kind of uh, narcissism, a form of narcissism. If they really reflect because, truthfully. Because does he, did he create us only so that we would just, you know, bow down and prosternate in front of him so that we would glorify him and say how wonderful he is, right? Is it just for that? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel that it is a bit narcissistic from God. Right, right, right. So but, you kind of get caught up in this trap of, well, what does God really want from us? Why does yeah. he need us to yeah, us. worship him and, and bow to him? And then the person almost was about to tell you, and what need did he, did he have to do that? Mm -hmm. He worshipped. But again, it's 
falling into the trap of God having any need, mm -hmm. right? But the person just stopped before saying this because the person noted that she came back, or the person came back to the first question of need as mm. a driver mm. of God, which is nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> but then, wouldn't it? Wouldn't doesn't this just become the, a little bit of a, a, a vicious cycle? Okay, fine. So there is no need. There is no. Yeah, obviously, is, God is God is bigger than that. Yes. So it comes back to us. Yes, but so then, where is the answer? Yes, but the thing is, if you if you base your thinking on a wrong foundation, deep inside, like you realized maybe that when you ask this question, why why did he need to create us? The answer was he doesn't need anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't make this information and this concept of God not acting out of need, mm. you fall into this endless cycle mm -hmm. because you come back to this trap. Yeah. But if you make it part of your thinking, now you can go a step up. So making what a part of our the thinking? The fact that there's no need driving. So God has no need, no need. And that is something that we need to establish because across the board before we can move ahead. Yes. So it's the first step. Okay. It's the first. But once you have adopted this foundation for your thinking, you can go one step up mm -hmm. in your understanding, the true understanding of the verse, right? So it is always the same thing. Uh, our, our wrong questions are always sourced um, in the same erroneous fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? This is what we need to correct. And so it is also very necessary to give an answer uh, or those who are asking, why am I here? Yeah. That is uh, satisfying to those who are embarrassed by this verse in the various degrees, you know, and who very seldomly dare speaking openly about the fact that they are uneased by the verse. Of so, course. Uh, it's hard to admit. It's hard to admit yes. that, well, I have a problem with this verse yes. that God is saying to me that I only created yes. you so that you can worship me. Yes, but if you want... A true answer mm -hmm. to this question, a direct answer to these interrogations, you cannot do it, um, let's say, directly. Because any answer, direct answer you will give is not correcting the wrong foundations in the thinking of the person that would allow the person to understand the verse. So you need to go step by step. Mm -hmm. So, because if you do that, you would enter with the person in dealing with erroneous logics and a sterile discussion based on what in Arabic is called fawda, of on disorder, right? You need to order the personal convictions and you need to clarify the concepts. For example, in this, in this verse, Allah says, I have only created mm -hmm. ins and men, mm -hmm. jinns and, and men, so that they worship me. The concept of creation. What is creation? Mm -hmm. Is it clear for us? The concept of what is a jinn, what is man? Mm -hmm. Is it clear for us? Worshipping. Is it clear for us? So if we start addressing this concept without clarifying them first, mm -hmm. the answer of the verse is not accessible. Uh, exactly. In truth form. And I was going to say, don't we need to first maybe um, so, define what worship is? Because maybe absolutely. worship also means having a good time. <laughs> yes. Maybe worship means eating great stuff, yes. you know? So... If we want a satisfying answer and a correct answer, you can only base it on a, an objective approach and methodical approach of the verse. Okay. And clarifying the various concepts. Okay. Yeah. So, very quickly. So, in the first place, we, we just noticed that the verse is a condensed uh, gathering of very fundamental concepts. Mm hmm and it contains an immense uh, amount of information that we can really summarize along three axes, right? Which is defining um, yes. jinn, man, so and of worshipping. What is creation? Yeah. The question of the two categories of being that are responsible and will be judged yeah. on, on the Day of Judgment. It's called the thakalei, mm -hmm. the jinn and the humans. Right. And then there's the question of worshipping. What is worshipping? Mm. And so, what I propose is that we can go... I, I must say, I find it interesting that those are the two categories of creation that will be um, judged on Judgment Day. So, plants won't be judged. Animals won't be judged. You know, I, I find it very interesting that we, we must put that into perspective. 
you know, um, and and take responsibility for what we do out there in the world, because there's a lot of beings and creation that doesn't have the same level of accountability or any accountability as we do. Absolutely. It's part of the order of creation. You have beings and beings that are judged and beings that are not judged. Yeah. Uh, you have beings who are thinking and beings who are not thinking. Mm -hmm. You can be a being thinking and not be judged. Yeah. Like the angels. Right. Or even uh, creatures that are created directly in paradise. Uh, so interesting, yeah. Okay, so it is part of this um, manifestation of the will of mm -hmm. the creator. So the first question really that is um, facing us regarding the question of um, all these three points, you know, these axes, if we want to avoid any improvisation when we deal with the subject is we, we can ask ourselves the concepts of creation, of its engine, and of worshipping. In, in the mind of people living today, are they very precise and, let's say, sophisticated so that they can understand the verse? Or do we need to work on this? We need to work on it. Because <laughs> we did, need the, help. did the contemporary have made any effort, systematic, yeah. you know, and objective, to, to make those concepts evolve on these three axes. You know? Okay, so help and of us. Of course, the answer is no. They have not made these efforts. No, so we haven't. We but let's break it down. So let's let's find out what what the the three um, definitions are. That's very important in order for us to move forward on this. Yes. So the first question, really, that we are facing in this verse is the question of creation. That's the first of the three categories. Yes. Okay. Because we we have only have created jinn and men so that they worship me. So the first thing that is facing us is the question of creation. Mm -hmm. So again, these three categories or these three axes of the verse is really the question of creation, the question of jinn and jinn, and the question of um, worship. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And we can summarize the question of creation. Let's take the first axe and try to clarify our concept of creation. Mm -hmm. So we can summarize the question of creation by uh, reminding that the Creator, Jalla Jalalu, is Himself, Al Alim, so the All Knowing, and Al Hakim. Al Hakim is the one who knows perfectly the link between the causes and the consequences. So God is All Knowing yeah. and and the knowing. ultimate wisdom, and he, he knows perfectly the link between causes and consequences. Right? Is Al Adl? Is just, mm -hmm. say, and muqsit is equitable, and khabir uh, informed or knowledgeable, all knowledge, you know? Right. So it means that he knows thus, because he's all of this, he right. knows better than anyone what he creates and why he creates it, mm -hmm. right? So if you are objecting to him, when you, you deal with the concept of creation, um, you are just like, as stupid as Iblis, mm -hmm. who refused by ego to prosternate in front of what Allah had created with his own hands. Right. Because Iblis wanted to demonstrate to the Creator the superiority of the fire over uh, the, the earth. So basically Satan was saying, I'm going to show you that you made a mistake to God, yes. <laughs> which is ridiculous, to... that you created Adam, um, which you think is, is a better creation, but I'm because the want, better creation. That's want, what he wanted to say. You want to prove to the creator, you explain to him the fire is superior to yeah. earth. Yeah. And he's the one, Allah, who created the fire mm. and the earth. So, you know, isn't it a bit stupid to object to the creator yes. when he's all of this knowing perfectly what he's doing right all right so i guess the first thing we do is establish god's perfection the god is perfect god is all-knowing yes. which is exactly what you just went over no, yes but uh, we have through the 99 asmael husna a breakdown the 99 yeah, attributes all of god knowing or perfect uh, attributes that uh, he gives us 99 of these attributes and the fact that he's a ladle and this Al Hakim, uh, that is uh, Al Alim, all of this, the all knowing, and uh, and you know, and uh, the one who knows the relationship between cause and consequence makes makes it impossible for it to make any objection. Mm -hmm. What he creates, 
Right. right. And also, it is absolutely necessary to remind that the creation, the question of the creation, and of the unique creator, is the first stone in the fundaments of the faith, la rida, you know? <clears throat> so, even if you take the, the Torah of the people of the book, mm -hmm. what they have in their hands today, yeah. whatever has been changed or not, they, the first pages also are concentrated on this question of creation in the beginning, etc. So, the revelation also of, to Sayyidina Nabi Muhammad, وسلم, who was sent to the entire universes, men and jinn, well, the revelation to him began by the very question of creation, like a priority for us mm -hmm. to understand that Allah he has created us. It's a priority for us to know our Creator. And in order for us to know Him, the first priority is to understand that He's the one who created us. The first revelation by the angel Jibril mm -hmm. uh, was recite yeah. in the name of your Lord who created. Right. Okay. So, so that importance was really impressed upon us. It is paramount. The fact that you present the divinity by starting with the question of creation yeah. allows since the start yeah. to really uh, end any questioning uh, by basing the relationship clearly, the relation between the creator and the created. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the being that is thinking has been created by a creator. Mm -hmm. Because it is self-evident that the one who gives existence yeah. is going beyond in excellence uh, to the one to whom has been given existence. And so it is also evident that there is an absolute supremacy of the creator on the created. Mm -hmm. right? And also, very clearly, that the created is totally dependent on the creator. And so we can go further in the Quran by addressing this very question uh, in the Surat Yunus. There mm -hmm. is an example in this, it's the verse, Surat 10, verse 3, where um, Allah says, uh, I will translate, uh, mm -hmm. Indeed, your Lord Allah is the one who has created the skies and the earth in six days, and then he established himself on the throne directing all things. Mm -hmm. There is no intercessor without his permission. It is him, Allah, your Lord, so worship him. Okay. Aren't so, you going to remember? Yeah, yeah. So, so again, we're, we're being told to worship him because he is yes. the supreme being. It is. The supreme again, of all, yes. This verse of Surah Nuyun is taking exactly the same elements, reminding us that he is the one who has created the skies and the earth, he di is directing everything, so worship him. Yeah. So, having established that, you can go to the second axe, which is really the question of the two categories of uh, beings. All right. Ins and jinn. So that's going to be in the next episode. And we should state, by the way, that you've learned this very thoroughly and in depth from your teacher. Uh, when you, you, in Damascus, who in, was the inheritor of a long tradition of uh, Muslim scholars. Yeah. Right. And, and how did he transmit all this knowledge to you? Oh, it's orally. Discussions and uh, over years and years, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A couple of few, more than a few decades, a couple of decades, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So until the next episode of this. But his point was always to not to impose any knowledge and to say, okay, I dreamt of this and or my opinion is this. Is to really read the Quran and get the meaning out of the Quran itself. So outside. encourage the thinking absolutely. as you read absolutely. the Quran. Because the Quran is is here not only to give us proper information but also to help us uh, learn how to think.